What does COVID-19 have to do with losing your home? A lot. The FBI reported that since the virus struck, cybercrime is up 75%. It gets worse. The legal title to all our homes are online now. The crime is called home title theft, and it's everywhere. Cyber criminals find the title to your home online, forge your signature on a quit claim deed, and refile as the new owner of your home. You're off title. They destroy you by taking out loans against your home, steal the cash, and stick you with the payments. You may not know until you get late payment or a foreclosure notice. Home Title Lock protects your home's legal title. Home Title Lock puts a virtual barrier around your home's title. The instant they detect tampering, they shut it down. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're already a victim. Then use code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. That's code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. On this episode of Newt's World... If you like the plan you have, you can keep it. If you like the doctor you have, you can keep your doctor too. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. Become Biden Care. Not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. We are long past the time to guarantee health care in the United States. I hope that we will move forward with a single payer Medicare for all program, which I think ultimately is the way we're going to go as a nation if we're going to solve the need for comprehensive, universal, and cost effective health care for all of our people. We're going to reform health insurance in America. America with the power of the free market. That's the American way that we meet our health care needs. We will never let socialism destroy American health care. Hi, this is Newt. Due to the virus, I'm recording from home. So you may notice a difference in audio quality. I'm going to talk about a Trump Republican approach to health and health care. How can we create a better system for better health longer lives, greater convenience, lower costs, and more choices. Now clearly, the current system does not meet that standard, nor does it meet the needs of the American people. Having spent well over 20 years studying health and healthcare, and written a book on it called Saving Lives and Saving Money, and helped found the Center for Health Transformation, I would argue that at least 40% of the current cost of healthcare is unnecessary, but that it cannot be solved by bureaucracy. So I wanna share with you what I think will lead to a better system at lower cost with better health. The fact is you and your doctor are not in control. Big systems are in control hospital systems, some of which are now gigantic, drug companies, many of which are now multi-billion dollar worldwide systems, insurance companies, which are almost all billion dollar bureaucracies, employers, and finally government bureaucracies. All of those set the framework within which you and your doctor try to function, whether it's what you're allowed to do, where you're allowed to go, how much will be charged, what you can legally be told. The result is that the costs are too high. The red tape is too frustrating. There are constant surprises. The number of people who talk to me about going in for a particular procedure, even if they've been told the cost of the procedure and then being surprised. One person pointed out that their insurance company covered the hospital. It covered the surgeon. It covered the operating room. Oh, it didn't cover the anesthesiologist. So when they got out of the hospital, one morning here comes a bill, I think it was $8,000, that they had no idea was coming because they had no idea that the anesthesiologist was in fact not part of the approved system. So there are constant surprises that make people feel very insecure and frankly, at times anxiety ridden about having to deal with the health system. But the bottom line is simple. You are not in charge and your doctor is not in charge. Furthermore, we're in a system right now where pre-existing conditions are not always covered. There's far too long a gap between scientific laboratory breakthroughs and your medicine cabinet or your doctor's office. There's no transparency on cost and quality. You don't know going in, 
out of five places you could have gone, what each cost, what their quality record is. There's not enough preventive effort. Part of it's our own fault. We don't particularly like to change our behavior. But part of it is that the system is not geared to fund prevention. The system is geared to fund treatment after prevention has failed. There's not enough chronic disease management and a very high percent of all health costs come from people who have chronic diseases, which gradually over time makes them sicker and sicker. Finally, with all of this going on, prices keep going up. And so insurance keeps going up. And I want to emphasize this. You can't have cheap insurance if you have an expensive health system because the insurance has to cost enough to cover the cost of the health system. So the longer the health system rises in cost, the more inevitably the insurance system is going to rise. So I think if our goal is less expensive insurance, we have to find ways to get to less expensive health care. For 55 years now, since Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society, we've tried bureaucratic cost controls. I was actually working with the Reagan administration as a junior congressman as they imposed a series of bureaucratic cost controls. All these things always sound great. You get a bunch of academics with PhDs. They run the right computer models. They give this great presentation. They have terrific PowerPoint. They only have one problem. They're not in touch with reality. It doesn't work. So what happens, though, because we have a bureaucratic focus, we look for cost controls, which means the government bureaucracies get more powerful. The insurance company bureaucracies get more powerful. The hospital bureaucracies get more powerful. The pharmaceutical middlemen become more powerful. The company human resource department bureaucracy becomes more powerful. A simple example of this is consider the number of times you have to fill in exactly the same form. I've known people who, frankly, in going around a hospital to different departments, have filled in the same form three or four times in the same day. One, it makes you wonder why are all the forms necessary, and B, makes you wonder why that's not all electronics you do at once, and then everybody gets to share it. To sum up, the current system is too expensive, too bureaucratic, both public and private, and focused on others making decisions about your life. Now, there have been two dominant patterns of reform. First, try to fix around the edges without really challenging the power structure. This is sort of putting Band-Aids over various things. And of course, what happens is these large, powerful systems, whether they're hospitals, pharmaceuticals, insurance companies, you name it, they just adjust. They hire people whose specialty is teaching them how to find the money. They're doing exactly what you would expect if you believed in how people behave. And so every shallow reform since the 1960s, just led the big systems to figure out profit optimization. They figured out a workaround. They figured out a new device. They figured out a way to call something a little bit different. But the key was the more rules there are, the more costs there are, and the more complexity there is. So there are whole layers in the health system of experts at finding money. They don't do anything for your health. They don't do anything for science. They don't do anything that improves the life of people around them. But what they do do is to make sure that their clients optimize their income. And that's where we are. And that's why that system, which has been tried again and again and again, it's the alternative to a purely government-run system. So conservatives who've been afraid to actually take on the core of the system keep futzing around at the margins, trying to find some clever devices that will fix things without infuriating the large structures who all have such a giant vested interest. My point would be, having watched this and looked at it and worked on it now, I think I first gave my first speech on healthcare in 1974. Every shallow reform since the 1960s simply led the big systems to figure out how to get around them. So the longer you've had bureaucracies putting out rules, the more the hospitals or the pharmaceutical companies or the insurance companies, the more people they hired to get around the rules that the bureaucracy had just issued. My best friend from high school was a tax lawyer, and he made a great deal of money and was paid in particular by Disney. And he told me one time his job was to figure out the next loophole 
faster than the IRS could close the old loophole. And as long as Disney was making money out of him finding new loopholes, he had a long career. Now think about that, because that's what happens with the health system. The bureaucracies come up with some new device that's going to save money, and lots of really smart people promptly start figuring out how to get around them. Now, the less solution to that is to create more bureaucracy with even more restrictions so that Biden care would build an Obamacare, which built on the earlier government programs. You can almost draw a chart from Lyndon Johnson and the beginning of really big government bureaucracies all the way up to what Biden is currently proposing. In every case, power is centered in bureaucrats. The system is defined and driven by abstract rules rather than personal realities. And in every case that we've seen so far, the left relies on tax subsidies, which get bigger and bigger and cost overruns, which gradually crush the system. So what happens is they set something up, oh, it's really going to be very affordable. Well, except it's not affordable. Well, I guess we have to find some more money out of government to make it possible. And then you either do one or two things. You run bigger and bigger deficits or you raise taxes more and more. In either case, what happens is because an unreformed health system is going to steadily increase in cost. And remember, this is almost one-fifth of the total economy. So if it's increasing in cost, it's eating up a lot of the economy. And the result is all of these cost overruns then crush the economy, leading to fewer jobs, lower take-home pay, more dependency, and ultimately bigger government. Now, Biden, for example, strongly supports a public option. He says, quote, that the bureaucrats at the National Institute of Health should set the value of what you get. Now, notice how far away from you that is. Some people you've never met in a room you've never visited who have no clue what your personal life is or your personal health is, they're now going to define value. And it's fascinating because inevitably, value-based systems lead to rationing. And you see this with Obamacare. For example, MD Anderson may be the finest cancer center in the world. It is not currently eligible for people who have Obamacare. You can go to their website and look at it. And in fact, something like 90% of the National Cancer Institute centers of excellence are not available if you're in Obamacare. Because what happens is they start looking for how to be cheap. The, the British health system is notorious for this, which is why women in Britain who have breast cancer are much less likely to survive than women in the United States because they don't want to pay for first-class diagnostics. They don't want to pay for first-class treatments. They don't want to pay for first-class doctors. And the result is a continuous drain as people go to other countries. Hi, I'm Gianno Caldwell. This week on Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, I talk to Pete Hetzel, a veteran and a host on Fox and Friends Weekend. We talk about his prediction for the election, what a Biden-Harris administration might look like, and his experience as an advocate for veterans. And we love our veterans. Listen to Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, the sworn enemy of PC culture, every Monday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. What does COVID-19 have to do with losing your home? A lot. The FBI reported that since the virus struck, cybercrime is up 75%. It gets worse. The legal title to all our homes are online now. The crime is called home title theft, and it's everywhere. Cyber criminals find the title to your home online, forge your signature on a quit claim deed, and refile as the new owner of your home. You're off title. They destroy you by taking out loans against your home, steal the cash, and stick you with the payments. You may not know until you get late payment or a foreclosure notice. Home Title Lock protects your home's legal title. Home Title Lock puts a virtual barrier around your home's title. The instant they detect tampering, they shut it down. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're already a victim. Then use code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. That's code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. What does COVID-19 have to do with losing your home? A lot. The FBI reported that since the virus struck, cybercrime is up 75%. It gets worse. The legal title to all our homes are online now. The crime is called 
home title theft, and it's everywhere. Cyber criminals find the title to your home online, forge your signature on a quit claim deed, and refile as the new owner of your home. You're off title. They destroy you by taking out loans against your home, steal the cash, and stick you with the payments. You may not know until you get late payment or a foreclosure notice. Home Title Lock protects your home's legal title. Home Title Lock puts a virtual barrier around your home's title. The instant they detect tampering, they shut it down. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're already a victim. Then use code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. That's code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. Here's the key difference. In the model that we believe in, the center of authority should be you and your doctor. You should set values. You should decide what you're willing to pay for. But in the other model, the center of authority are bureaucrats and, quote, experts. And the experts are always theoretical academics who have interesting ideas, many of which end up with death panels, which were real until they were beaten down politically. So how do we get to better care if, in fact, the left can't do it? We believe we can build a better personalized health care system with better outcomes, less cost, and greater convenience. Now, I know that sounds almost like it's too perfect to be true, but here's the key question. This is what defines virtually everything else in redesigning a failed system and moving it towards a steadily more and more powerful and more and more capable system. Are you a client or a customer? When you go in as a patient, Should you be seen as a client or as a customer? And here's the difference. Clients are always subservient to the bureaucracy. It's the bureaucrat who has the authority, not the person. Customers, on the other hand, are the center of authority. And the person who's serving them has to worry about the customer. So if you walk into McDonald's and you want a fish fillet, they have an obligation to figure out how to get you a fish fillet. And if they say, you're just one of our clients, we have a really good deal on a McChicken. And so we're going to give you McChicken whether you want it or not. You'd walk out because you're the center of authority. They're not. But in a bureaucracy, when you go in, you're told this is what's going to happen and this is how it's going to be taken care of. And by the way, one of our experts, or we have a panel of experts who've defined on value. Now, McDonald's has an easy way to figure out value. What are you willing to pay for? And what will you order? And that defines their behavior because it's centered on you, not on them. This actually goes back to a classic study in what's called the Austrian School of Economics. What happened was between 1880 and 1900, a group of economists in Vienna went down to study prices at the fish market. This was before they had refrigerators. And they suddenly realized that the price of fish changed all day, that When the fish came in first thing in the morning, they were fresh, and they were bought by people who were going to serve them at a nice dinner. And so they drew a very nice price. Since there was no refrigerator, as the day went on, the fish got to be a lot less fresh, and the price started to drop. And then as they studied it, they realized the same person would come back on different days at different times to pay different amounts for the fish. And it was a function of how they were valuing what they were going to do. So maybe if they were just cooking for their family, they'd buy a less expensive fish. But if they were cooking for guests, they'd buy a more expensive fish. And what the Austrian school concluded was that it is impossible for a bureaucracy to understand pricing because pricing is decided all day, every day by you. And they can't possibly get in your head and make all of these decisions. So they came up with an entire model of a market-centric system. Now, that contrasts radically with the kind of pressure that a centralized bureaucratic system has, because in a centralized bureaucratic system, they've got to have a committee somewhere that defines price and defines value. And they're not talking about themselves. They're not the patients. They're not setting with the standards. They don't actually know what the real value is. So 
here's the challenge, and this has been the great challenge which President Trump has taken on far more than any other president. To be a customer, you have to have a market. And to have a market, you have to have both information and power. That is, if you're a customer and you don't know what anything costs, you can't make any decisions because you have no knowledge. It's all random. Or if the prices have already been set by some bureaucracy and they're not negotiable, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. You're going to do it or not do it. On the other hand, if you don't have the power to say yes or no, just knowing about it doesn't help you any because you can't respond to the change in information. So for a real market to work, for you to truly be a customer, you have to have both information and power. Now, compare that to the current system and think to yourself, who has the information and who has the power? With each year since 1965, more and more power and information gets centralized higher and higher. So in an ideal left-wing world, somebody in Washington at Health and Human Services would have artificial intelligence systems and would have perfect knowledge of the entire country and would define for you what getting a mammogram is worth, at what age, under what circumstance, with what family background. Well, the total volume of that is astonishing and almost guarantees you're going to get into the politics of some people saying, well, maybe that general principle is good for everybody else, but I'd like you to give me an opportunity to sort of break the rules. And that's how these kind of central bureaucracies become corrupted. That's why in the Soviet system, you had such a huge level of people who were basically operating outside the system. I understand what the real rules are, but by the way, I happen to have you know, a fifth of vodka, and maybe we could talk a little bit more about this. And so a great deal of the Soviet system degenerated because people constantly look for ways to get what they want, even if the bureaucracy says no. So if we're gonna have a real market, the first great requirement is transparency. And here, President Trump has taken a leadership role which is very controversial among the various groups who make money out of your health. Next year, you're gonna be able to find price and quality information for the first time in modern history. And that's gonna lead to tremendous revelation. There are examples of five or six hospitals in the same area that can have as much as a 40 or 50% difference in the price of delivering a baby with no difference in quality outcome. And in fact, in some places, the less expensive hospital has a better track record than the more expensive. But of course, you don't know that because we don't currently have systems that require that information to be made public. We do know that in places like LASIK surgery or plastic surgery or orthodontics, where people can check for price and quality, that it drives prices down dramatically. LASIK surgery has become just unbelievably inexpensive compared to what it cost 20 years ago. So one of the first big steps in the right direction is to have an absolute commitment to transparency in both price and quality. Uh, President Trump has already moved in that direction, and that begins to really change the whole game. Because for the first time, you begin to have the initial characteristics of a customer. You'll have knowledge about what your choices are in both quality and cost. The second thing I think you've got to do is eliminate pre-existing conditions as a problem. It's still true today that you can find yourself in a situation where you cannot get insurance coverage or the price is so exorbitant that for all practical purposes, you can't get it. That has to be fixed because people have a deep, passionate belief that no one should be left behind to suffer from bad health conditions just because of a weakness in the insurance system. And again, President Trump has signed an executive order. We're moving towards a system where we believe a guaranteed coverage system will guarantee everybody the ability to buy insurance that is both affordable and that covers any condition they already have. That's a very central reform if, in fact, people are going to be comfortable with the health system. When I wrote my book, Saving Lives and Saving Money, I put it in that order because I wanted to emphasize that health is, first of all, a moral issue in which we are trying to save lives. 
and only secondarily an economic issue in which we're trying to save money. And thinking through the pre-existing condition system and developing the guaranteed coverage system, which would have a modest transfer of money in order to focus on unique cases and guarantee that nobody gets priced into dying unnecessarily or suffering unnecessarily. That's central to, I think, a morally legitimate system. We don't just need to make sure that people with pre-existing conditions get coverage. They also need to get the care they really need. Most people with pre-existing conditions have some sort of chronic illness. The Trump GOP approach allows for the creation of specialized plans that partner with the best doctors and hospitals, ones that are left out of Obamacare plans, to help you manage your illness and stay in the best health. President Trump created these plans at Medicare Advantage this year. The GOP approach would allow for the creation of these plans in the individual market. But right now, you can't have them. Hi, this is Newt. I want to invite you to sign up for a yearly subscription to my Inner Circle Membership Club. We're in a critical time in our history where the outcome of the next election will set us in a course of two very different American futures. As a member of my inner circle, you'll receive exclusive invitations to join my video conferences with 2020 election updates and my analysis of the upcoming presidential debates. Here's a special offer for my podcast listeners. Join my inner circle today at newtsinnercircle.com And if you sign up for a one or two year membership, you'll receive a limited edition Inner Circle Challenge Coin, exclusive to 500 members only as part of your membership welcome package. And as an Inner Circle member, you'll receive an invitation to attend my members only event, Live with Newt, a discussion on the next presidential debate. And there are many other benefits of membership. Sign up for a one or two year membership today at newtsinnercircle.com. That's newtsinnercircle.com. I think other great breakthroughs are going to both increase convenience and lower cost. One has accelerated dramatically because of COVID-19, and that's telehealth or telemedicine. More and more people begin to realize that You can now have access to your doctor without travel. You can have access in a way that the doctor gets all the information they need and that you can save both a tremendous amount of time and a tremendous amount of money. This will be particularly important in rural America and particularly important for senior citizens who find it more difficult to go places. It's also going to provide much greater access for veterans who may live a long way from a veterans hospital. So telehealth or telemedicine is going to become a dramatically bigger part of the system. One of the things we're working on, and this is where the president's driving effort on vaccines may become a model for how we deal with dramatic breakthroughs in science. You know, we're right at the early stages between artificial intelligence, understanding more and more about DNA and various breakthroughs in materials technology and in biology. We're right at the edge of a revolution in how we take care of people. Truly personalized health in which we will be able to identify you as a unique person, understand exactly what your DNA requires, and develop a solution for you to maintain your health. That requires the kind of thing the president's doing with the effort to create vaccines in that we want to be able to apply that across the board. Everywhere we look, We want to focus on really big breakthroughs and on maximizing the rate at which we improve people's lives. For example, I'm told that we're within four or five years of being able to cure sickle cell anemia. For a number of Americans, particularly African-Americans, sickle cell anemia is a very painful, very debilitating disease which shortens life dramatically. Being able to get that cured, being able to accelerate getting that to the market, being able to make sure that everybody who potentially will suffer from sickle cell anemia has access to that kind of cure. That's an enormous improvement in the quality of life. We're seeing breakthroughs in treating Alzheimer's, and it's conceivable 
that by 2050, Alzheimer's will no longer be a major threat. In fact, one of the things we're looking at a great deal at Gamer 360 is the very concept of aging. One very exciting new approach looks at all the various age-related diseases like dementia, frailty, heart disease, cancer, and others. And instead of trying to treat them as separate diseases, looks at the common root of all of them, which is that your risk increases as you age. So the approach is to treat the actual things that happen to your cells as you age that makes you more susceptible to them as a way to treat and ultimately prevent the various diseases. And in fact, you may be capable of living in a very healthy way for much, much longer than you think. And so that would change everything and would require us to really contemplate if we start becoming a country where people are 110, 115, 120 years old and relatively healthy and active, that's a very different environment than anything the human race has ever seen before. Part of this will lead to, I think, with all this new science and all these new applications, to specialized plans for chronic conditions. So if you have diabetes, for example, or if you have hemophilia, or if you have a kidney disease, we may discover that there are very creative ways to provide both for treatment and insurance for your particular conditions in a way which maximizes the effectiveness of you leading a full life despite having a chronic condition. One of the things that the president has done is he allows tax-free health plans so that you can have a savings account that's tax-free. You can then use that to pay for the insurance you want, and you can work with your employer so suddenly your insurance follows you. It doesn't follow your job. That's really important because if you move towards a system where you can have an insurance plan which allows you to have a fairly large amount of money for relatively small conditions, the price people pay goes down radically if they don't have to go through an insurance bureaucracy. If you're a doctor, somebody walks in and they're willing to pay cash, it is amazing how much less expensive it is. In fact, cash paying patients normally pay 40% less than patients who have an insurance plan that has paperwork and has the time value of money, the doctor has to hire somebody to take care of the paperwork. Then they've got to get, wait around to get paid. Then usually they'd only paid part of what they charge. So then they have to come back to you and so they can get the rest out of you. Well, if you walk in and say, look, I got cash. What are you going to charge? The places where it's currently working in Wichita, Kansas, this is a good example. You've seen doctors take 40% less because they eliminate all the bureaucracy, all the waiting around. And one of the places that this is beginning to emerge on a large scale are the Walmart health centers. There are only a few of them right now, but Walmart plans to keep rolling them out. To give you an idea of the difference in price, the Walmart health center charges $30 for an annual checkup. I don't know what you paid the last time you had an annual checkup. I'll bet it was a lot more. They charge $25 for a dental exam. They charge $25 for teeth cleaning. We're going to find that the danger in the kind of Biden, big government, big bureaucracy approach is all of these new innovative applications, all these efforts to bring in new technology and new approaches, all of these get crushed by bureaucracy. If you're forced into a one-size-fits-all, government-defined health care plan with government bureaucrats supervising everything, all of these new innovative, price-lowering, product-improving things just kind of disappear. One of the things that's really fascinating is you can begin to have plans that have no networks. So instead of having, as Obamacare did, cutting out 90% of the expert cancer centers as defined by the National Cancer Institute, you can go where you think you need to go for whatever your problem is. Finally, the development of association health plans by President Trump and the Republicans has allowed small businesses all across America to come together and to begin to organize their own insurance plans and their own approaches in ways, some of which are very innovative. And that's the key. What I wanted to get across is we're right at the edge of a generation of very dramatic breakthroughs in science and technology. We're at the edge of a generation of very dramatic entrepreneurship, finding new, better, less expensive ways to do things. Nothing will kill that faster than going to a centralized, big government, bureaucratic system that has to issue the same rules for everybody, has to police everybody, 
and which inevitably gives power to the big boys. Big bureaucracies love working with big hospitals and big pharmaceuticals and big insurance companies because they can all get in the same room and work out a deal. What they don't like is millions of small businesses, hundreds of thousands of independent doctors, and tens of millions of individual citizens as patients going off on their own, being innovative, focusing on a better future, and doing what they think makes sense. I do believe it's possible that we can get to a system of better care for everybody. We can do it in a way that it is less expensive, provides a more rapid transition of science into your life to save you, and at the same time does so in a way which is more convenient and provides for our children and grandchildren just a dramatically better health future. And that's why I'm committed to making sure that we don't go down the road of a bigger government, more bureaucracy, more distant system that will inevitably bankrupt the country through transfer of funds and at the same time cripple all of us by blocking the best technology, the best science, and trapping us into an entire cycle of mediocrity. Newt's World is produced by Gingrich360 and iHeartMedia. Our executive producer is Debbie Myers, and our producer is Garnsey Sloan. Our researcher is Rachel Peterson. The artwork for the show was created by Steve Pendley. Special thanks to the team at Gingrich360. Please email me with your questions at gingrich360.com slash questions. I'll answer a selection of questions in future episodes. If you've been enjoying Newt's World, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and both rate us with five stars and give us a review so others can learn what it's all about. I'm Newt Gingrich. This is Newt's World.